Martin. I'm the library director. And um, on behalf of the Legacy Museum of African American History and the library, I want to thank you for coming and thank Kelly D, our esteemed scholar and author. We're very excited, and everyone who has started reading the book can't put it down. So. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? Thank you. And there's no sticky tack on here, so that means that you might actually want to read it. Thank you so much to the Legacy Museum of African History and Culture, who is um, in the library as well for organizing this. I'm part of the Legacy family, and it's always nice to do anything with you. And I'm, it's always an honor to be here um, to represent the museum, even though I'm not there anymore. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the actual book that I have in my hand. And I say this because this was originally an idea in my head. Um, it turned into my dissertation topic when I was a graduate student, and then it was just basically files on a computer for a very long time. And I'm talking a total of 10 years, it was files on a computer, right? From making mistakes, from you know, the computer crashing to everything else, then printing it out and actually holding the weight of this big, thick document. And then they printed it in this teeny little book. <laughs> I was like, how did this turn into this small little book? But it did, and it's there, and there's words, and it says something, so that's a good thing, right? Um, this is my third talk now actually having the book in my hand, and it's very exciting. We're selling them here tonight. Um, and a lot of people come to my lecture, and I've been giving this lecture for a very long time, to hear about food. They want to hear about food, right? Food is exciting. Food is sexy. Food is safe. What I'm trying to do with this book and, and all of the lectures that I give is to, to be able to tether the notion of the romance of food and the pain of slavery. The fact that you cannot talk about the history of food particularly southern food, without talking about chattel slavery. You just can't do it. It's one and the same. So we can celebrate the Paula Deans and somehow ignore the people down the street that had the same kind of food, even more authentic, probably better, and cheaper, yet they don't get credit for the food that their ancestors created, while people like Paula Deen are making millions of dollars off of what is essentially black food. So my book is challenging a lot of ideas, not only about a cultural heritage and ownership of cuisine, but how we remember the people that, in, that were enslaved and worked in these kitchens. So today I'm going to start out by giving a sort of sobering um, excerpt out of my book. I'm going to read it to make sure that you know, everybody understands that we, again, are talking about both slavery and food tonight. Surrey County, Virginia, 1860. It was the eve of the Civil War, and Suki went to bed every night thinking about the labor of her days. Cooking on a Surrey County plantation was a stressful task that occupied all of her five senses and consumed almost every moment of her life. She provided several meals a day to the white family who enslaved her and to whomever came to visit. Food was more than sustenance. It was at the core of Virginia hospitality. Her friends in the field worked from sunup to sundown, while Sookie remained bound to the fire in the big house's kitchen 24 hours a day. She was forced to cook multiple meals that were both scheduled and spontaneous. Up every day before dawn, Sookie baked bread for, <coughs> excuse me, baked bread for the mornings, cooked soups for the afternoons, and prepared divine feasts for the evenings. She roasted meats. She made jellies and puddings and she created desserts for every free person who passed through the plantation. Sookie lived in the kitchen and she slept upstairs above the hearth during the winters and often outside come summertime. Her children learned to cook and work in the big house when we're always under the watchful eye of the white family. Private moments were rare, as was the ability to truly rest. She rose early to bake, cooked all day, and went to bed with the next day's menu both in her mind and on the large hearth on the first floor of her kitchen quarters. Cooking for a Virginia plantation was a challenging task, one that required culinary talents, nuanced social skills, and physical strength. The labor was intense. Lifting huge pots of water, standing for hours by the open fire, her workday bled into the night with no space for respite. Suki was a typical enslaved cook and undoubtedly worked herself to death. Cooking provided her and her family with a unique status within the bonds of enslavement, but it came at a high price. In 1860, Suki died at the age of 50 from a hemorrhage womb. 
likely caused by overexerting herself for the sake of Virginia's famous hospitality. So I set the tone of my book with a very sobering story about this woman named Sookie. Sookie was an actual woman that was enslaved in Virginia. Sookie also represents the countless black women and some men that have labored, whether it's in slavery or after, for white families to make sure that this idea of Virginia hospitality, Southern hospitality, stays strong and famous. So it's a way to kind of bring you in to be able to start thinking about the individuals that made this, this hospitality tradition an actual thing. <clears throat> The purpose of my book is a couple of things. It's to give credit to those men and women who were forced to cook <clears throat> and create both soul food and southern hospitality generally. It is what Michael Twitty, the culinary historian, calls culinary justice, giving credit where credit's due. And everybody can understand this, right? You have a recipe that you got passed down from your grandma, you go to church, somebody steals it and they claim it as their own. That makes anybody upset, black, white, young, old, anything else. Those are my cookies, right? Don't steal my cookie recipe. That belongs to my family. You take that idea and you put it on an entire culture. And it's even more powerful and more important. Another part of my book, another point of my book, is to call attention to the historic kitchens that remain as memorials for the lives of these enslaved cooks and reminders of their contribution to this country. I'm a historic preservationist. I believe that these buildings should not be uh, knocked down. And I'll get into that in my talk. And lastly is to redefine the idea of enslaved cooks against an enormous amount of myths that we're gonna talk about in a second. And to re, uh, refigure the ways in which people think about the men and women that worked in these homes. I start with this slide. I like to shock people and then come back and then talk about it and then go back in again, right? Yeah. Every time I give this lecture, every single time, and I gave it last week at Roanoke College and I've got some of these coming in the mail from someone in the audience, one person at least always says, I have one of those things. It's embarrassing, I put it away, or I collect those things, would you like to have my collection? I have an entire cupboard and my colleague Jerry Schrago can, you know, attest to this, filled with these shameful objects, these racist images of black cooks. <laughs> these images represent this mythical enslaved cook, right? When I first started this work, I thought immediately, you know, who are these enslaved cooks? And sadly, the only image that popped into my head was Aunt Jemima. Who is Aunt Jemima? The notion of Aunt Jemima is that she is a loyal slave. She loves that white family. She is disconnected from her West African roots, disconnected from the, the, the rich cultural traditions of the people that were enslaved in the field, right? She was loyal to that family and Uncle Tom's as well. You worked in the house, you didn't care about the enslaved brothers and sisters in the field. It was all about your status symbol inside of that house. Her entire world was there to please whites. And this kind of black Americana, which is what this stuff is called, came about right during the end of the Civil War, lasted, oh, well, it's still around, but it lasted um, until the end of Jim Crow. And it was used to normalize images of black labor and servitude in white homes. You didn't have a bunch of black folks running around and buying these things and putting them in their kitchens. This was a way to uh, subtly remember like the good old days, right? to normalize that black labor within that white landscape. So the stage of my research, as I like to call it, is a plantation uh, landscape, right? I, I, my work sits firmly within the larger plantations in Virginia. These are the Shirley plantations. This is the Monticellos, the Mount Vernons, the homes that were big enough to not only have an enslaved cook, but multiple enslaved cooks, assistant cooks, a separate laundress, plantations that were so wealthy that these were the places to go if you were trying to have a good time in the 18th and 19th century Virginia. Who here has recognized or has recognized this symbol in Virginia? Who here has seen it all over the South? 
the pineapple, you're going to start seeing it. If you're shaking your head, no, I'm sorry. You're going to see it for the, you're going to never be able to unsee this again. These pineapples represent hospitality. If anyone's been to Williamsburg and they used to have the hospitality house and there was big pineapples everywhere, there's pineapples all over Williamsburg. Pineapples represent hospitality. Because during the period of slavery, if you were rich enough, wealthy enough to have pineapples on your dinner table, that meant you were very likely involved in the slave trade. You got ships coming and going, bringing enslaved bodies and food from the Caribbean, getting those pineapples, bringing them up, getting your rum shipment, your pineapple shipment. If you can offer your guests a pineapple, you are as rich as it gets. So that became the ultimate symbol of hospitality, right? And I'm not saying that pineapples are racist, they're not, but they have this relationship with the history of slavery and hospitality in this country. During the 18th and 19th century, you know, the, the 1600s, people were eating to live. They were eating rats at Jamestown. They were eating each other. It wasn't like people were sitting down to these grand meals, right? Right around 1700, when the women started coming over in droves, the slave trade really kicked in. Houses were being built as mansions, not just as homesteads. Things started to change. These women that were coming over wanted to have dinner parties. They wanted to flex their wealth. And they wanted to have these feasts. And when I say feasts, I want you to think about this very literally, right? They would have multiple courses. You would, if you were a guest at one of these plantations and you were white and free and elite and you showed up on your carriage, you would have you know, food from the moment you got there to the moment you left. You would sit down to supper and you would have multiple courses of food. Some of it French inspired. I'll get into the African part in a little bit. But you were feasting. This was very much a part of the social fabric of Virginia and the country generally. Now these plantations were places where you flexed wealth. Again, imagine yourself a free person, a white person showing up. You travel for two weeks from North Carolina to get up to one of these Virginia plantations. You put your enslaved nanny on that coach, your children. Everything is put on to that carriage by enslaved people. Your coachman, your nanny comes with you. Occasionally, if you're going to one of those big Virginia barbecues, you bring some of your cooks as well, because they're going to be out cooking in the back with everybody else. You travel for a few days, and you show up to one of these plantations, say it's Stratford Hall, it's the great hall at Stratford Hall. You show up and you are greeted by an enslaved butler. All of your things are taken care of. You get off with your big old puffy dress or your nice outfit and you get off and everything is taken care of. It could be 4.34 in the morning. And that mistress, that white mistress will ring the bell and the cook will wake up and she or he will start making you some food. So cooks were on call 24 hours a day because everything was set up to please these elite white folks. It's just how it was. I don't think anybody in this room would be like, oh, I wouldn't want to be that. Because you're sitting there getting catered left and right. They had some moral issues, obviously. But this was a culture that was very, very attractive to these white folks, right? Part of what would happen in these homes is you would be, if you were a man, you would go into the parlor and you would drink. You would drink a lot. Now I want you to think about every single thing that was being consumed on these plantations from the blackberry wine that was made on that plantation. The seeds were planted by enslaved labor. They were, the <coughs> berries were picked by enslaved labor. They were mashed up and turned into brandy by enslaved labor. The rum from the Caribbean they're sipping on is a West African recipe. Rum came from West Africans in Barbados in the Caribbean who were laughing at the planters because they had all this extra sugar cane that was rotting. And they're like, we make palm wine where we're from. Why don't you take that and turn it into something? So rum was born out of West African culinary skills and traditions, brought over, and then became a major, major moneymaker for these, settle these white settlers. Same goes for tobacco, all of these things. So to be an elite Virginian during this period, or southerner, 
you were participating, whether you were an abolitionist or not, unless you were like, you know, people are now very conscious about what they consume and what they buy. You are participating in one way or another in the benefits of having a slave system. Because everything that you had on your body, the clothes to everything you ate came from slave labor. Struggles, hold on. So these plantations were social spaces. They were used um, for these very wealthy mistresses to marry off their children. I've read countless letters that are, some of them are in the book, about these women talking about planning these parties. If you want to marry your daughter off to the richest guy in town, your meal better be pretty good. It's all about that wealth. So the cooks found themselves, because they were so skilled, as a very important central uh, uh, player and even marrying people off. Because that food had to be a certain caliber. You can't make beanie weenies and get that rich guy down the street. You gotta have your 17 courses and your puddings and your brandies, which again, all came from enslaved labor. <clears throat> now I wanna switch gears and talk about this a little bit. I am in love with this painting. I am in love with this painting because it is everything that I hate about the ways in which these stories have been told. This is from Berkeley Plantation. This is a 20th century painting. And I hate to laugh, I've been looking for this image for so long and I finally got it about two weeks ago. This is, in essence, what plantation museums, if you go visit them, tell you what was happening in the kitchen. This is if they even talk about the kitchen or if they talk about slavery which nine times out of 10 doesn't happen. This right here is an image of the mistress. She's cooking all the food, right? Her slaves are just sitting there helping her and they're all clean and happy. It's so absurd that it's funny, right? This is the story that is told at these plantation museums. The majority of Americans get their history from weird stories that are passed down, sometimes that have you know, all kinds of mistakes in them and from plantation museums and public history sites. Unless you go to college and choose to take a class on this stuff, you're gonna miss the boat on all this. So I love this picture because it is the essence of what I'm pushing back against. Go ahead. Who here has been to a plantation museum, house museum in the South, and they start talking about how the kitchen is outside because of fire? and because of the smell. Anybody hear that? It's pretty common, right? This comes from this one quote that came out in 1705. 1705 was a period when there were a lot of enslaved Africans coming over. And the idea of race became really, really attached to status. The number of, of enslaved or indentured Africans that were being brought over was dwindling, the ones as far as the ones that were able to be free, like the ones that moved up to the Eastern Shore, got their freedom, had some rights in the early 1600s. That was gone by 1705. The slave laws were being put down hard. If you were black in Virginia, you were presumed to be a slave. During this period, the architecture changes. The kitchen started being put outside. And there's incredible evidence to show this. And there's two things that I want you to think about, just pragmatically. One is the idea of this being a fire hazard. Now, these old homes have fireplaces in every single room. Every single room, even the kids' room, has a fireplace in it. So the whole fire thing is a little iffy. Now, I want you to think for a second about the smell of food versus your husband who hasn't bathed in six months. <laughs> Back then, people didn't, they didn't wash themselves. They took shower, they took shower, they took a bath every six months or so if they were lucky. Hot Virginia heat, no air conditioning. Everyone is a little ripe and you're worried about that stew cooking in the kitchen. So there's a, there's a very curious thing that happens when you start seeing the ways in which these stories were changed during the Jim Crow era. And I'll get into that in a second. This right here is uh, our two pictures of Stratford Hall's kitchen. 
one from the early <clears throat> excuse me, 20th century, and this right here is Mary, and she works as an interpreter at Stratford Hall. And before I get into this, I'm going to read an excerpt of my book talking about these kitchens as important places uh, to remember this. Charles City County, Virginia, 2016. Grand plantations pepper the landscape along Virginia's Route 5. To drive through rural Virginia is to gaze back into the 19th century. It is, a visually stri I'm sorry, it is visually striking and has remained mostly untouched for the past 150 plus years. The homes of Virginia's elite white families have held up over time, while the slave quarters have been demolished or allowed to fall back into the earth. The more you know about the history of these buildings, the more it hurts when you see the slave quarters destroyed. These buildings are direct reminders of the people who called them home. Their walls speak volumes across generations, and they remind us that the ancestors persevered. They are like tombstones marking the lives of millions of enslaved Africans throughout the diaspora, and when they stand tall, they invite questions and inspire answers to one of the darkest moments in history. Their vanishing only reinforces the idea that such places do not matter, and that these homes, symbols of pain and survival, are unworthy of preservation, memory, and respect. These buildings are where enslaved folks created families against incredible odds, and they are essential parts of the American story. So I talk about this for a moment in here because it's important to think about these buildings. They are part of the American story. All of this is part of the American story. For a very long time, we've only been talking about that white male elite story. And that is very much a part of our story. But it is stories like this, buildings like this, that remind us that the majority of people who are in this country, their stories have not yet been heard. So when you see these buildings collapse into the ground, when you see them stand tall, just take note of it. Start to think about these things in a, in a different way. Now, if you were an enslaved kitchen, and you, I mean, I'm sorry, an enslaved cook living in one of these kitchens, you'd be living upstairs, typically, at one of these plantations or to the left or right of the actual kitchen. You'd be working 24 hours a day, as I said, the bell system was in force in most of these homes. You had to wear multiple layers of clothes weighted down with water to make sure that your pants or your apron does not catch fire. I, don't, I had to, oh, one day, I went down to Williamsburg a few years ago and I was like, I'm just gonna get dressed up in this outfit and go out there and see what it's like. I lasted about 20 seconds in that kitchen. It was so incredibly hot. My outfit was just disgusting. Even wearing those clothes, I mean, I know it was normal back then, but the layers that you had to do and the wetting of the skirt and the bending down and the lifting of iron pots. It's a lot on your body. You understand why Sookie died, right? You understand the, the, the pain of this. And not only that, uh, the burns that happened to enslaved cooks. They died more from burns than anything else. To test an oven's heat during this period to see if it was hot enough to make bread or biscuits, you've got to stick your hand in there. And if it's too hot to keep in there for a few seconds, then it's ready. I'm talking about fire coming up and everything else. It was not an easy task. So by the late 1700s, right after the Revolutionary War, you see the architecture take another shift. There was a shift where kitchens were put outside of the house, when race became married to status, when it was presumed that if you were black of African descent, that you were going to be a slave. This is when all the ideas about race really started to cement. Now by the end of the, the, excuse me, the Revolutionary War, you have conversations about freedom, right? Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. These conversations were being overheard by enslaved folks, talked about by enslaved folks, and the notion of freedom was very much on the minds of the people who were enslaving as well. And this new nation had to figure out exactly what their relationship was going to be with the institution of slavery. Now by the time the transatlantic slave trade, the British one closed in 1808, you have a very, very big moral obligation to at least Think about, consider what you're actually doing to these human beings who you held in bondage. This is where you see the architecture shift. 
Thomas Jefferson and his fancy uh, dumb waiter over here, you can go, okay, you're Thomas Jefferson, right? You invite some fancy guy, some abolitionist, or some European who des despises the institution of slavery, but he wants to go to your house because you're Thomas Jefferson. He can show up in his carriage and everything else. He can come into your dining room. He can get wine up here through this magical fireplace. You can have a dumb waiter. Think about that term for one second. Dumb waiter. When, you know, when Monroe comes over for dinner, the waiters that are actually enslaved human beings are standing there waiting hand and foot. But if someone comes that you don't want to show off your slavery, you know, your, your, uh, your moral uh, issues, you can do things like put dumb waiters in between every single place setting. So all of these things start to respond in ways that masked the politics of blackness. So you also see things like the underground uh, passageways that are very, very common. And people, some people say, oh, but there's this Palladian thing, right? They're this gorgeous, you know, classic design. And it was just a way that they were, they were adding to the architecture of their homes. Well, why did most of the planters then dig holes underground to get to the kitchen? There's nothing architecturally nice about that. And you hear the story when you go to these plantation museums of what? What are those passageways used for? For to keep the weather off, right? Because they cared so much about rain getting on their enslaved waiter. Again, you go to these tours and you're sitting there just like, are you kidding me? But I go and I hold my breath and I write articles and I get more and more grumpy every time I do it. But this is also to challenge you guys, no matter what tour it is, to ask questions, to, to see if what is being said is really real because there's a vested interest in misrepresenting the past if it's uncomfortable. <clears throat> the whistling walk here, oh my goodness. The whistling walk sign, I am on a mission to own this thing. It was at Berkeley Plantation. I'm doing work for them right now. Apparently it's not up anymore. I want this in my possession. I'm going to put it up with all my horrible, you know, black Americana stuff and talk about it as a, uh, a very significant sign. So anybody here has been to Berkeley Plantation at all? Charles City County, and they've had the same tour for a very long time. I went there when I was 17, a very long time ago, and I went there a few years ago, and they had the exact same VHS tape that you pop in there. And you sit on those little, you know, chairs that are wobbling everywhere. It's all musty and... They just don't have the finances to do it, to do anything else. You go on what I call the wallpaper tour, which drives me insane. And I know everyone, if you've been to a house museum, you've been to one of those tours, right? It's the most unsexy, boring way to see a house museum, I think. Get some social history in there. I don't care what it is. Talk about the people. Do something besides talking. They know more about the wallpaper and the, the, you know, the, the furnishings than they do about the people who lived there. And that's something that house museums need to really start thinking about because people want to know these stories. So you go on the wallpaper tour of Berkeley Plantation and they lead you out and they point to this whistling walk underground passage sign. And there was a shocker, right? There was a passageway dug out underneath to the kitchen. And they say, we used to, they used to make the enslaved cook or waiter whistle while they walked the food over to make sure that they weren't going to steal any of the food. So what does this do? This represents black folks as untrustworthy right off the bat. It also has this weird way of, of pretending like black folks weren't cooking the food and tasting it. They were this deep in the biscuit dough 20 minutes before dinner and all of a sudden they can't touch the food or taste it as they're, as they're going in. So there's a couple of things going on here. The whistling thing is built into um, the paranoia that happened after Nat Turner revolted. White folks were terrified of being overheard by their enslaved population. So as loud as you can be to come in here, please be that so I know you're not going to overhear what I'm saying. So there's that. The second thing <clears throat> is that this is a Jim Crow era sign. The Jim Crow era did some really weird things, laws and all that aside, to our memory of how race and race relations were during slavery. It went from, you know, having your wet nurse, nurse your white children, having your enslaved cook cook all of your food, 
having black folks wait on you hand and foot, lay at the foot of your bed if you need anything at three in the morning. Some people even had children with their enslaved folks, right? So this was all happening. All of a sudden, Jim Crow comes around, and the people that were sitting there having sexual relations, being very, very intimate in a lot of different ways, whether you're delivering someone's baby or what, couldn't even drink out of the same drinking fountain. What on earth was that about? Laws aside, all the stuff that we normally think about Jim Crow aside, what was that narrative about? That reprogrammed people's ideas about blacks and whites. It got them thinking that, you know, because whatever had happened in the past, this law that came into play had to separate them completely as if there was no relationship, good or bad, that happened. It's an interesting thing. So this sign is a Jim Crow era sign that represents the Jim Crow era want to have people have this very different, separate relationship. Because talking about complicated relationships is too hard. No one wants to talk about the middle ground. It's easy to put things in little boxes and say, this is good or bad, that person was a saint or a sinner. No one wants to talk about everything else in between. And that is not only a problem for African American history and African American issues, but it's a problem for this nation on a whole that we cannot talk about the harder issues, the shared history. This is an American problem, and it was born so much out of the Jim Crow era. Go ahead. Talk for a second about the food. Yes. Oh my goodness, last week. You guys know uh, Joseph McGill? He has a slave dwelling project. Have you guys heard of him? Oh my goodness. He was down at Roanoke College last week. And he now travels with this guy, Jerome Bias, who makes, you know, heart style food. He made the most banging, delicious okra stew I've ever had in my life. I ate four bowls. I did not care. I kept getting back in line again. It was delicious. That aside, because I'm getting hungry because I haven't eaten dinner, <laughs> um, okra stew is something that takes multiple forms. If you're in Louisiana, it's gumbo. If you're in the Caribbean, it's pepper pot. If you're in Virginia, it's Brunswick stew, which sometimes does or does not have okra in it. But it's this one pot meal, it's this heavily seasoned food. White folks weren't eating heavily seasoned food. You go to England on one trip now in 2017 and you'll see, unless you go to an Indian restaurant or something, that British food's not that flavorful. It just isn't. The palate of what we think of as delicious American Southern food comes from the palates and the memories and the recipes of West Africans who brought over their palate and brought it into the house. Now things like oyster stew, making head cheese, all of these recipes that are incredibly complicated were made by enslaved cooks. The seasoning changed over time. And what I really like about what I found out is by the uh, 18th century, you've got these cookbooks coming out. The Mary Randolphs and everything came a little bit later. And they're mostly, the early ones are mostly written recipes that are fairly white, right? By the 19th century, you start seeing things like okra stew and pepper pot in these cookbooks. That means that the food was definitely being cooked in the 18th century, but it passed some kind of culinary test. They liked it so much they wrote it down. And what I did is I went into the archive and I read these old handwritten cookbooks. And you know when you get your grandma's cookbook and you drop it down and it opens up to that page and it's really dirty? <laughs> right? I just used my brain. I was like, that's a recipe that was used over and over and over again. And so I was able to not only recreate the use of these things by just using your brain, you know, which of the pages are the dirtiest, it's going to be the best meals, you know, the best recipe in there but also tracking on how you know, the, the food changed over time and how West African food very much became part of the American palate. I'll we'll talk for a second about the poisoning that happened as well. There's a chapter in my book called Notorious uh, Chefs. It is about the famous ones like Hercules, James Hemings, and it's about the ones who poisoned or attempted to poison their masters. Now, West Africans came over with incredible knowledge of, of herbs and medicine. The, the, excuse me, the midwives and medicine men on plantations typically were black. A lot of the white folks that had these plantations would go summon one of the healers in the quarter to come up and fix things. 
the midwives were also African descent, right? So you think about the role of a cook, and I get this actually, this is something that um, Ted Delaney said on a tour he gave me years ago, but in the back of these recipe books are uh, also recipes for medicine. The difference between medicine and poison is dosage. It is that simple. So, oh, make me some of that, you know, make me some of that tonic to make me feel better. <laughs> Just takes a little heavy hand and, you know, masters, bye-bye. Now, this is also, think about before germ theory, right? <laughs> before germ theory, you don't have, poisonings aren't somebody running up with a hypodermic needle stabbing you. They didn't even have those things yet. You get the poison through your mouth. Who's feeding you? Who's cooking that food? So sometimes cooks got caught up in poisoning attempts that had nothing to do with them, but they just happened to be making the vehicle to which that person was killed or almost killed. I want to touch real fast on uh, that myth of these enslaved cooks um, being very whitewashed, loyal to the white family, all these things you think of, right? That Uncle Tom, that that enslaved man who somehow sold out to his brothers and sisters in the quarter, right? There is very strong evidence, I'm an archaeologist, very strong evidence of hoodoo being practiced inside of the kitchen, inside of the plantation house, well into the 19th century. So during even the period of the Civil War, you've got enslaved black cooks, generations removed from their ancestors who were coming from Africa, practicing West African Voodoo, hoodoo, putting hexes on people, putting powder, using all the spells and the, the conjuring all the ancestors to be able to protect them within that house. Now, if that isn't evidence of strong cultural survival and connection to the quarter folks, I don't know what is. I'm almost done, you guys. Before I end, I want to introduce you to two of the people in my book. One of them made the cover. I was torn between Chef Hercules, who's on the right here, or a nameless woman from Amherst County. <clears throat> now on November 6, 1855, David Hunter Strother, who worked for <clears throat> excuse me, um, Harper's Bazaar magazine, traveled around the South and started to record things under a pen name. He stopped for a night in Amherst County, right up the road here, and stayed the night and wrote, and it's in my book, a very long uh, description of this woman, saying that she was uh, the most, you know, um, what was it, uh, wealthy in not just books, but skills, talking about how she was the pinnacle of that plantation that she ran the place, basically. This was an enslaved cook. I do not know her name. He did not record her name, but he drew a picture of her, which I think is incredibly important because we do not have a lot of photographs of enslaved cooks or of enslaved people. And when it comes to in cooks in Virginia, all we have are these two images. Now, Chef Hercules, who I would argue is the first American celebrity chef, was born in 1754. George Washington bought him when he was 16 years old. He married a woman named Alice, who was a seamstress at Mount Vernon. They had three children, Evie, Richmond, and Delia. After his last child was born, his wife died shortly after. When he was 32 years old, he became a cook at Mount Vernon, started cooking in the big house. 1790, Hercules shows up as the president's cook in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania had passed, very recently, the Gradual Emancipation Act. If you owned slaves in the state of Pennsylvania, you had to free them within six months. Now, the White House was in Pennsylvania. There were a lot of enslaved folks working in that White House. Philadelphia had a vibrant free black community. So Hercules, Chef Hercules, would go back and forth from being on Mount Vernon to up being the chef, the presidential chef in Philadelphia. Washington was a little shysty, wrote to people saying, you know, this law is really messing me up. So every five months and 20-something you know, days, he sent 
his slaves back to touch Virginia soil. Just long enough. Now in doing that for several years, Hercules met a lot of people. Hercules also figured out probably every single which way to leave Virginia if he wanted to. He sold his leftovers out of the back of the, the, the White House kitchen for $200 a year. It's a lot of money. He worked there <clears throat> for five years. I'm going to give you a description of Hercules before I talk about what happened to him or what we presume happened to him um, after he left. Though homely in person, which I would argue he's not homely, but though homely in person, he lavished the most of these avails on dress. In making his toilet, his linen was of unexceptional whiteness and quality. He had black silk shorts, black waistcoat, waistcoat ditto stockings. He had shoes highly polished with large buckles covering a considerable part of his foot, a blue cloth coat with a velvet, velvet collar and bright metal buttons. He had a long watch chain dangling from his fob, a cocked hat, you're not ready for this, and a gold-headed cane. 1970s, anybody? Right? Amazing, right? So that black aesthetic is real, and it goes way, 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 way back, right? Way back. So Hercules would walk down Main Street in Philadelphia, and white men would bow to him. So he was going back and forth, being basically the king of all chefs in Philadelphia, and then being brought down every five months and some change to be that, you know, house slave on George Washington's plantation. Now, in 1796, he was recorded as shoveling manure on Mount Vernon plantation. Nobody knows what happened between him and Washington or him and any of the folks in that White House. Washington was closing up his time, but something happened. Something happened. On Washington's birthday, 1797, he woke up to find Hercules gone. Hercules escaped. No one knows where Hercules went. He sent all of his men after him. It bothered him so much that his beloved chef would run off. Shocker, right? And think about all the people that he met. He was the president's chef. You know he met heads of state in Europe, people in ports. So this image was found in Europe. It is owned by a Spanish museum. So I like to think that he made his way up to Washington, D.C., got on a boat, and sailed off into his freedom, and was able to be a skilled, free chef for the rest of his life. <clears throat> I end with this image because I want to sort of sum up everything that I've said. That enslaved cooks were very, very central to Virginia's food culture, to plantation culture, to southern hospitality. If you think of Virginia as the sort of mother state of the United States of America, it is very easy then to say if it started here, it bled out into the South. Enslaved cooks were legitimate, con uh, co <clears throat> excuse me, contributors to African American, I mean, to American culture, and especially food, and that they were also subversive players, all within the bonds of enslavement that they were able to flex little bits of power through poisoning or other means to live a certain kind of way, all while being enslaved. Thank you. Now I've got coffee. Does anybody have any questions? And this is so weird because some of you have read part of my book. I'm <laughs> like, oh god. The funny thing is when I first um, got the subtitle for my book, you know, it says, you know, how Virginia's enslaved cooks helped invent American cuisine. And I'm like, my book isn't about food. I don't understand this. And I realized I hadn't read my book. Because when you write a book, you write it in chapters. And sometimes you write it backwards or upside down. You cut things from here to there. I didn't actually know what it sounded like or read like. So that was kind of a funny epiphany to realize that I hadn't read the book that I just wrote. So that said, I've read it recently because I had to index the thing. So I should be able to answer more pointed questions or not. Yes? That was one of the real reasons that Columbus set sail, right? Okay, we look at the spices. Mm -hmm. 
the blandness of the food. <laughs> exactly. To to and to preserve it, too, because yeah. they were all eating rotten stuff. Yeah. Yep. And okra. And okra. Oh, sorry. He's saying uh, one of the reasons Columbus started to sail was to look for spices. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Definitely. And okra, there's a lot of food that comes yeah, directly okra. from West Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I come from Wisconsin, where most of the food is pretty bland. <laughs> I was in graduate school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I met a number of young black professionals back 50, 55 years ago, who yeah. said, oh, Peter, you've got to learn about soul food. <laughs> was soul food something that grew all the time? Or yes. Because there were these upscale restaurants. Right. I looked in there. In and you don't have soul food there. Right? The whole thing is soul food. So if you think about the term soul food came about in the 1960s when during okay. the black power movement, during this moment where black folks were coming out of the Jim Crow era and really taking pride, right, yeah. in their identity and their history and heritage. And so soul food is, is all of that. And if you think back before it was coined as soul food, it was the food that you got when you came out of the, the field and your, and your mom was back there cooking and everybody put a little bit of something in that pot and you were able to eat something besides that bit of fat back that the master gave you, right? Are there still soul food restaurants around? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Martha will, she'll, she'll find you one, I promise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All over the place. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. I noticed in your presentation that you referred to the kitchen as an office. There is a building not far from here that uh, the mansion itself has been torn down, but the smaller house has been left there to remain. And the controversy over the years has been the house was once used as a kitchen. Oh, it's wow. a very small mm -hmm. building. So I mean, you showed the part about the underground tunnel. I said, okay, that would connect the house to the small building. Right. Most people I talked to today have told me that this house was an office. And they're trying to bring it into the 21st century, I guess, and say it was office for judge, so on and so on, whatever. I still think it was a kitchen. So my question is, is the terminology office one that you... Um, yeah, if, if, how big is the hearth? Do you see if there's a hearth there? I, I I'll take it. one look at that thing, and I'll tell you if it's a kitchen or not. I've seen almost every kitchen in the state. And the next project is to document them all and get a big website going. But you can tell by the hearth. The hearth that's big enough to cook on is probably a kitchen. They used uh, this house in, um, since then for um, new land jobs, company, and okay. different offices have been inside, so I think they've been renovated. As an office. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of times the kitchens remain because they were built because they were part of that front stage landscape. Because you didn't want, you know, your the field quarter houses on your landscape. If someone's coming to visit you, you want everything looking pristine. And so a lot of these kitchens and laundries were made with the same materials or almost as good of materials as the big house. Yes? Okay, um, the thing I always heard was, like, the slaves ate the leftovers. Mm -hmm. So that's where, like, chitlins mm -hmm. and pink feet and all this stuff. So is, is that really true? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the white okay. folks were eating it, too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you think about Southern food, yeah, absolutely. It's like you get whatever you can, right? Like, the whole hog was eating. Like, I'm going to eat every single bit of that hog because that's all you have, right? right? And you know, you clean it out enough, right? it should be okay. But that's absolutely true. Okay. Absolutely true. Now, big feet and all that kind of stuff is a delicacy. It's weird how that swings, right? Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said pig's feet are now a delicacy. They have those, what was, I was just in the um, Moore's County store eating fried catfish the other day, and they had um, the pickled knuckles. I can't, I can't. The pickling thing is a different direction. To put the hot sauce on, I'm fine. But I don't want that pink stuff. I can't do it. I can't do it. And you see these connections too um, throughout the diaspora. So if you're an enslaved person in the Spanish colony, the food was going to have a different kind of flavor versus the French colony. That's why gumbo and New Orleans food is so different from Virginia. Virginia, we've got that sort of British, German, uh, African thing going on. You move down south, you get more of the Spanish influences or the French influences. And you know, the Caribbean, same exact thing. Yes, from one of the interesting things that I noticed, though, is that um, up north, there are more restaurants now that one side might be Chinese and the other side might be Jamaican. Yeah. <laughs> Jamaican Chinese yeah. 
Yep, and Chinese were brought over when slavery exactly. ended. They were brought over to be indentured right. servants, so, so that food mushed together. Right. Exactly. The Caribbean is fascinating for food, right. and the East Indian stuff too. Oh my goodness. Right. So I love Caribbean food. Has just got a different name, but it's right. the same food. Right. Right. Let me put this one on here for anybody. You, how many of y'all have actually eaten at the, the Billy Moore hot dogs? Yeah. The chili? Yeah. Have you eaten that? Okay, a black woman named Melissa Pulley was the one that created that chili. Okay. And Billy Moore made millions of dollars off of Melissa Pulley's oh, chili. It's pretty good. It is Ex so hot. Yeah. And it's outstanding. Because I see those hot dogs, Dan, and I'm like, hmm. I mean, I'll eat some hot dogs. I have no problem eating anything except for those pickled pig knuckles. I'm good with those. With that and brains, I'm good. I'm good. Have you, um, how many plantations that are, like, go ahead. How many plantations would you say are under restoration in terms of looking at the kitchen and, all, and also looking at trying to recreate um, information about the enslaved families that actually resided there? The president's homes are doing, the, the bigger presidents, Jefferson and uh, Washington, they're doing a pretty decent job right now. Monticello's doing a great job. They've gotten tons of money from Rubenstein to do that. Poplar Forest is trying. Um, a lot of this takes money. And it also takes the trust of the board to believe the people that are running the museum that it's actually okay to talk about these things. And so, you know, all of this boils down to fear and boils down to money. And so the places that um, are getting money right now are the ones that, one, have a high profile site, lots of visitation, and two, um, honestly, are brave enough to start talking about this stuff. David Rubenstein writes texts for tens of millions of dollars to Monticello, to uh, Montpelier, to the Arlington House on the other side of slavery up in Northern Virginia because he's watching to see who's willing to do that. And so there's a lot of really cool things happening right now, but it's money driven, and the thing that's keeping it from actually going in that direction is fear of losing tourists, which we're already losing tourists. So, you know, this next generation, I teach public history at Randolph College, and I taught it all over the place. This next generation of students, they want, they want to hear these stories. They don't want anything sugar-coated. And my generation doesn't either, but my generation also doesn't want the wallpaper tours. You can talk about the wallpaper, but you can't omit the stories of the people that were there. And you have to be able to tell all of it, good, bad, all of it, and be able to appreciate our history. And so, you know, hopefully in 10 years I can say, wow, all these places are doing this. We're still very behind the curve. Well, the other thing that, that sort of um, scares me, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest, you can be driving in these communities, and you know what you'll see? You'll still see those um, jockeys mm -hmm. on the lawn. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And people don't see that as being inappropriate. Do you know the history behind those things? No. no. It's, it was a, wasn't it's somebody actually totally fascinating. And I heard this years ago, and I was like, yeah, right. It's one of those things. But I actually heard about it before the internet was, you know, the god of all knowledge, whatever. Um, those things are used, yes, as that, right? Mm -hmm. But the history behind them are when, um, are when uh, jockeys used to all be African American. Right. And then they integrated. Right. And they lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually a way for the black folks that are part of that jockey community to have a sort of memorial to what they did. But that only lasted this long, and then, just like all material culture, people grab onto it and do something else with it, and it turns into this thing that's very different, right, than the way that it was intentionally supposed to be. But, you know, but it's still a statue, know, right? It, yeah, it's a statue, yeah. and I, I've only seen it here. I have, I've never seen it if you go... I've actually seen it in California. I have not. Yeah, but, um, and I'm just like, why do you have that? That's the first time I saw them, and then I found out the history behind them. But they're, but they're still highly offensive. Yeah. I'm not saying that they aren't, but that's just a really interesting piece of information that at one moment they were a symbol of pride, and that went completely the other direction. Yes? Present-day restaurants in our region that specialize in southern food, which would you say are most authentic, and how authentic are they? That's a really good question. Um, the funny thing is, you know, you go into southern food generally, you think about, you know, fried food, that technique also came from West Africa. Um, pork chops, you know, eating every single bit of the hog, um, all of that, greens, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, the, the notion of authenticity, I think, is really interesting, right? Because I can say, this is the most authentic meatball recipe of a town heritage, right? Ever. 
but like somebody else from the same village that my ancestors came from might hate that meatball recipe and they like theirs more. So notion of authenticity, I think, is a lot, um, it's really socially constructed in a lot of ways. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, think about, you know, how is it being presented, right? Um, and white folks, I know some white folks that can cook some soul food, like, shockingly good, right? And I also, yeah, <laughs> they're like, yeah, right? <laughs> but, you know, it depends on, you know, but they also learn from probably, you know, their cook in 1964 as well. So, I mean, I, that's a really hard question. I want to open that up because I don't, I don't know. Yes? Kelly. Probably I grew up with loads of what is considered soul food, but I grew up in that but here I was in this white middle class home. However, my, my mother had learned to cook from her mother and different people, but the food was basically the, the cooked greens, the turkey with the ham, and the, all that stuff, the peas, black eyed peas. Mm -hmm. and, and those came the directly peas, from West Africa. Even the greens, like, right. Because the English settlers weren't eating vegetables. And then they when weren't. we started hearing about salt food, it was kind of like, well, what is it? We yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting. And also the funny thing in the city, a large city like Memphis, the grocery store, when I was in my early 20s, people would come from the Northeast to visit or something. If you happen to go in a grocery store shopping, they'd be having a fit over all the <laughs> The right. Right, and I think the fact that that has been normalized as generically southern food with no credit given to the, the West African roots is where all of this lies. Right? Um, a lot of the states in the South, and especially the counties, were majority black. So the idea of driving through um, the original title of my dissertation, my dissertation, the original title of the book, was When Her Thousand Chimneys Smoked. And it's a quote from someone traveling through Virginia talking about all the kitchens and all the smoke and all the food smell that they smelled when they drove through, or didn't drive through, rode through Virginia on their, in their carriage. And so the idea that these people are cooking, think of all the enslaved communities, all the pots in the slave quarters, all cooking, smelling it from all over the place. You got poor white folks passing by, eating with one another. I mean, that food, it was cheap, one. And it tasted damn good too, right? So it's really easy when I just like that recipe book that pops open to that page, soul food, all the things that we think of that came from the plight of enslaved Africans and African Americans made its way into the fabric of Southern food. Yes. I just want to thank you and commend you for doing this research. Thank because you. Because so much of our history is hidden. It's not correct history, like another hidden figure, hidden, hidden knowledge. Right. And I'm so glad I came out tonight to hear you talk about this because we know about Aunt your mom and the cream of wheat and blah, blah, right. blah, but Rastis nobody talks that. about the essence of where, from whence it's coming. Right, and what does that all mean, right? Yeah. Black labor, okay, we get that. What yeah. about black skill, black yeah. talent? Yeah. Where's yeah. that conversation, right? But I can cook. I'm a good cook. I'm a homemaker. Right. Uh-oh, Jimmy's going to be inviting himself over. Watch out what you say. <laughs> 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 right. right on. Yeah. Where's that old school Southern food? Where's that old from, from my grandmother? Yes. In the kitchen with her. Right. How to make the right this and stirring this. And I just love it. I, 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 it's I love an art. It. Yeah, it's, it's an art. art. And it should be respected as an right. art, right. too. Good Absolutely. Job. No, down on the shoreline, uh -oh. a whole lot of fish get the yes. food. Those people ate good down yes. there. Yes, and the oysters. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the flour, the flour, the flour. They ate good down there. They ate good. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I didn't even miss some of this, but I'm trying to hear you. Okay. But in your research, have you discovered that any of the cooking traditions from Africa found their way here. We spent the last 15 years in South Africa. Right. And the continuity between music there and music here was just... Yeah, those it. roots, right? And is there the same kind of... Tradition? Yes, absolutely. You have ingredients, yams, black-eyed peas, millet, um, most of the greens that we eat, those were things that West Africans were eating. Most West African communities during this period were almost all vegetarian. When they made meat, they fried it or they barbecued it and heavily flavored, right? When you think about barbecue, it's heavily flavored. Spices for days, dry rubs, all of that stuff is a, a very essentially West African and probably South African. So you brought over in the slave trade. So not only do we have the ingredients, like I just mentioned, 
but you also have the cooking styles, right? Yeah. So the, the slaves took away blandness from America. Yes, thank goodness, right? Yeah. <laughs> the flavor is really important. And I know you had good food in South Africa, so my dad was there for at UCT forever, and he would come back, and the recipes, oh my goodness. It's good stuff. They got the East Indian mix down there, too. Well, I would like to sell, I mean sell, yes, I would like to, sell, I would like to sign your books and sell them to you. Do you see my little dollar signs coming out? <laughs> oh my goodness.